Good morning, everyone. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. My name is Song Yu, pastor here at Sully. We welcome you all who are worshiping God this morning. A great privilege to get together, even through the online uh, this morning. Shall we start our service with prayer? Our Heavenly Father, we are privileged to enter the Holy of Holies in your heavenly throne by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. We are ever thankful for your holy presence in our midst as we worship you and honor your name today. Will you bless our time in this precious time of worship through the movement of the Holy Spirit who refreshes our minds and hearts and souls as we encounter you, our living God. All for your glory, for your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. everyone. Have any of you guys ever gone to the grocery store with your mom? I'm pretty sure you have. As you walk up and down the aisles, there are hundreds of cans with food in them, right? How do you know what's on the inside? Hmm. On the outside of the can, there's a label with a picture that shows you what's on the inside. If you pick up a can that has a picture of apples on the label, you would surely expect to find apples inside the can, wouldn't you? Of course you would. If you pick up a can with a picture of peaches on the inside, you have every reason to expect that there are peaches in the can. If you were making an apple pie and opened a can with a picture of apples on the outside, but it had tomatoes inside, it wouldn't make a very good apple pie, would it? Well, we sometimes wear labels that tells the world that we are followers of Jesus. Some people wear a cross around their neck or a t-shirt that says, Jesus, he's the real thing. Some people may have a honk if you love Jesus bumper sticker on their car. When people see us displaying these Christian labels, 
They have every reason to expect us to be the real thing. They expect us to live in such a way that it's plain to see that we really do have the love of Jesus in our heart. When John was preaching and baptizing, many people were coming to be baptized because it was the popular thing to do. That made John very unhappy. You're a bunch of snakes, he said. Do you think that a little water will make you okay in God's eyes? The way you live should show that you have repented of your sins and turned to God. What should we do then? They asked John. If you have two coats, give one to the poor, he answered. If you have food, share it with those who are hungry. Some of these coming to be baptized were tax collectors who were famous for cheating people by collecting more taxes than they owed. To them, John said, if you're a tax collector, collect no more than the government requires. Others in the crowds were soldiers. John said to them, don't try to get money from people by threatening them or making false accusations against them. Be satisfied with your pay. John wanted people to know that labels were not important if they were not a true picture of what was on the inside. That's just as true today as it was when John was telling people of the coming Messiah. What should we do then, you ask? If God has blessed you, share it with those in need. If you have food, share it with those who are hungry. If you have two coats, give one to someone who is cold. You know, sometimes during Christmas time, you might see people wearing a button that says, Jesus is the reason for the season. Do we really believe that? If so, people should see Jesus in the way we live. Let's pray. Father, we confess that we don't always live the way we should. Help us to live in such a way that others will see that we have the love of Jesus inside. Help us to repent of our sins. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It's time for praises and prayers. We praise the Lord for this opportunity to gather together and worship our Lord. We pray, uh, praise the Lord for God's continued protection over our church family and friends. Uh, here's a new prayer request. We pray for Erin, daughter of Linda Lutro. She's recovering from the recent surgery for an infected uh, gallbladder. We pray for her solid recovery in Jesus' name. We continue to pray for our sister Mary Lawson, mother of Melanie Williams. She has a throat cancer, uh, is scheduled to have surgery on October 26. She lives in Florida. We pray for Joel Pennington, uncle of Jason Mills, who has a uh, stage four kidney cancer. We pray for Mariah, who needs a kidney. We pray for William Becker's continued solid recovery. We also pray for our little baby, Paisley Palmer, who has a tumor of acute leukemia. We continue to pray for our sisters, Terry Abate, Diane Miller, Vicky Ronyan, as they continue treatment to ensure they remain cancer-free in the name of Jesus Christ, the great physician. Shall we pray for God's blessings upon our brothers and sisters? Lord, we come before you with wounded, broken, hurting. You receive us with your warm heart and open arms, Lord. We lift them up to you, our brothers and sisters to you, in our prayers for your special care and touch. Will you stretch your mighty healing hands to each one of them? Touch them. Pull them with your mighty hands so that they may be able to endure this time of challenge and hardship with trust and hope in you. Thank you for binding us as a family of faith. We are here to gather for each other, to keep each other accountable, bring about the best in each other, and sustain and encourage each other as we walk through this time, especially through the pandemic together. Thank you, Lord, for loving us no matter what. We love you, Lord. This is our prayer in the name of the Lord, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread 
and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. This morning's scripture reading comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24, verses 13 through 27. This is part of the Easter story according to the Gospel of Luke, verse 13. Now on that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, What are you discussing with each other while you walk alone? They stood still and looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there in these days? He asked them, What things? They replied, The things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to, the, to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, beside all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astonished us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb, find it just as the women had said, but they did not see him. Then he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are! How slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared! Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. It's time for offering prayer. Uh, many of our church members uh, send their offering through online. Thanks to your generous giving, even self sacrificial giving, uh, we carry on the kingdom movement here at Sudley. Thank you all so much for your generosity. Shall we take a moment to bless our offering before the Lord? Lord, you are the ultimate owner of everything, including our life. You're the ultimate author of world history. We come before you with humility, acknowledging your sovereign authority over our lives, our church family, and our nation, and your creation. Will you help us to continue to discern your will, your blueprint for our life, so that we may bring glory and honor to your name and enjoy a profound sense of fulfillment and meaningfulness in our journey? Whatever this offering is used, let your glory be manifest. The love of Jesus Christ will be experienced and celebrated in multiple tangible ways. Lord, will you bless your precious sons and daughters who dedicate themselves to you through this offering today. Thank you, Lord, for the gift of our life, the gift of our eternal life through Jesus Christ. We come before you with a holy desire to listen to your word. Will you speak to each one of us? Touch our hearts and souls, Lord. Allow us to feel your presence in our midst and listen to your voice. Speak to us. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. We've been exploring Bible Study 101 over this season. Interpreting the Bible has been increasingly difficult and challenging as we deal with various controversial issues of today's world. How can we present the timeless, absolute truth of the Bible to the ever-changing world? That's the task. Unlike old days, when we have a certain standards of a biblical interpretation, which were taken for granted, now we live in a time 
when every authority is questioned, whether religious or secular, and normative ways of interpretation of the Bible are relativized and trivialized. It's simply difficult to set a norm or standard of how to interpret the Bible properly in this world. If you believe that the Bible is the Word of God, then you would accept the biblical authority over your life. Meaning that the Bible is the guide for your life journey on earth, especially for your salvation. As written in 2 Timothy 3.15, the sacred writings that are able to instruct you for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. So this morning we explore how to interpret the Bible properly, prayerfully, under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. When it comes to biblical interpretation, one important thing to keep in mind is to interpret the Bible as a whole book, as a unified, a complete collection of authoritative texts, not just a random collection of separate materials. Which means that when you try to understand the meaning of a biblical passage, you don't simply try to find out its meaning within the immediate context of the book where that passage is located. But you need to unpack its meaning against the backdrop of the whole Bible as a whole book. Mm. Let's say you read John 3.16. We are very familiar with this passage. And you try to understand its meaning. While you pay attention to what it says as it is written in the Bible, you need to unpack its meaning within the context of the book of the Gospel of John and within the New Testament and ultimately within the whole Bible. Does it make sense? If your understanding does not fit with the overall message of the entire Bible, it's likely that it is not a proper interpretation. However, it does not necessarily mean to try to harmonize obviously conflicting views in the Bible. There are some passages in the Bible that appear to be conflicting views to each other. You know, we, don't, we don't have to harmonize or try to minim minimize the differences all too quickly. We should be careful not to do so. Because differences might be due to the historical, contextual uh, conditions. The biblical interpretation requires prayerful and careful approaches. This is why we have pastors and teachers and biblical scholars among us who can help us to find a proper ways of understanding the Bible. So we pray the prayer found in Psalm 119.18. Open my eyes so that I may behold wondrous things out of your law. And this is why the Holy Spirit is so critical in our attempt to understand the Bible. Because the entire Bible is inspired by God, right? God breathed it. Meaning that human authors touched and moved by the Holy Spirit wrote the entire Bible. So when we try to understand the meaning, penetrate the meaning of the Word of God, we have to rely on the guidance and inspiration of the Holy Spirit who moves in our midst as we pray to the Lord. Mm. We're going to explore this, the role of the Holy Spirit next week. It's a very exciting topic to cover next week. What is fascinating to realize about the Bible is that the Bible contains the foundational stories of God's mighty movement in our world history and it also contains the basic interpretation of what that means to us. Did you hear that? The Bible tells us the stories of how God interacted with God's people, intervened in their lives, and led God's people according to God's purpose. And also at the same time, God, the Bible provides the very critical interpretative clues and tools for understanding its meaning. Ah. So here comes the importance of the tradition of the church. Over the centuries, our Christian ancestors, predecessors have developed normative ways of interpreting the Bible, providing helpful guidance on how to understand the Bible for us. One of the uh, practices 
is to let scripture interpret itself. Let the Bible interpret itself, which means with the help of the Holy Spirit, we'll try to unpack, understand what the Bible says through the Bible. Uh, let the Bible interpret itself for us. Psalm 119, 130 says, The unfolding of your words gives light. It imparts understanding to the simple. So, what does it mean to let the Bible interpret itself? And how can we do that? That's what we're going to explore this morning. <laughs> Today's passage, the Gospel of Luke chapter 24, contains Easter stories. On the third day after Jesus' brutal death on the cross, two of Jesus' disciples left Jerusalem. They were walking to a village called Emmaus, talking with each other about what happened in Jerusalem over, over those days. Perhaps they were terrified, traumatized by the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. They had faithfully followed and supported Jesus' ministry. They hoped that Jesus would be the one who would liberate Israel from the oppression of their enemies. Perhaps they were grieving with a sorrow and sadness deep inside. Then Jesus Christ, who rose from the dead that morning, in the first Easter morning, joined them, came near to them incognito. For some reason, the disciples did not recognize Jesus. And Jesus said to them, what are you talking about? And they stood still and looking sad. And one of them answered, are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there in these days? And they began to tell Jesus about Jesus of Nazareth and how the religious leaders handed him over to the Roman soldiers to be condemned to death and crucified him. And they said, we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. And Jesus said this to them in Luke 24, 25. In Luke 24, 25. Shall we check it out if you have the Bible? In your hand, this is a good time to check it out together. Look, 24, 25. Jesus said to them, Oh, how foolish you are! How slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. Hmm, very interesting, very interesting words from Jesus. Later, when their eyes were opened in the breaking of the bread, they finally recognized the risen Lord Jesus Christ, and the Lord vanished before their sight. And they say to each other in verse 32, Were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? What is fascinating to realize from this Easter story is that when the disciples of Jesus Christ were terrified, they were traumatized and discouraged and said, Jesus Christ visited them. Jesus walked with them on the road to Emmaus and helped them to open their spiritual eyes to see God's mysterious purpose by opening the scriptures to them. Hmm. The great message from this passage is, is, is that when we are confused and puzzled and lost in our lives, when we get anxious and worried about our life journey, walking to Emmaus in our life, Jesus Christ who rose from the dead has conquered the world, surely visits us, comes to the core of our suffering hardship, our dark time. Ah, helps us to open our spiritual eyes and ears so that we may see and know God's mysterious purpose and plan for our lives by opening the scriptures to us through the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Isn't that the message of hope for us? That is the message of Easter, isn't it? The whole Bible essentially contains the salvation history of God through Jesus Christ. Old Testament talks of the promise, the prophecy of the coming Messiah. And the New Testament talks of the fulfillment of that promise, that prophecy. In whom? In Jesus Christ. 
Ah, in a nutshell, the entire Bible as the salvation history of God points to whom? Jesus Christ as the sinner. Somebody said the central theme of the Bible is salvation. And the central personality of the Bible is Jesus Christ. Do you remember a threefold meaning of the Word of God? The first, the written Word of God, which is the Bible. Second, the spoken Word of God, which is preaching, proclamation. Third, the living Word of God, with a capital letter W, living Word, Jesus Christ. It means by reading or hearing the written Word of God and listening to the spoken Word of God, we are led to a holy encounter with the living Word, Jesus Christ. What it implies is that the entire Bible is to be interpreted in the light of whom? Jesus Christ, through the lens of Jesus Christ. This is called a Christ-centered interpretation. Ah, again, because the entire Bible revolves around and points to the living word, Jesus Christ. On the walk to Emmaus, Jesus himself opened the scriptures to his disciples and interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures, beginning with Moses, meaning the law, the first five books in the Old Testament, also called the Pentateuch, or the Torah, beginning with Moses, the law, and all the prophets. Jesus began to interpret to his disciples the things about himself. Uh -huh. When the historical events and narratives of the Bible are brought under the light of Jesus Christ, all the stories come to have a new meaning in the light of Jesus Christ. Just like when we encounter Jesus Christ, right, our life comes to have an entire new meaning in the light of Jesus Christ. Even our life events we experience before we encounter Jesus Christ, when those events are brought under the light of Jesus Christ, whoa, those stories come to have a new meaning in the light of Jesus Christ. Ah. Shall we briefly explore how the New Testament makes sense in the light of Old Testament? Especially about Jesus Christ, the central personality of the Bible. And you will see how to let Scripture interpret itself, how to let the Bible interpret itself for us. The Gospel of Matthew begins with the incredible news of the birth of Jesus Christ, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. Matthew 122. Shall we check it out? Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew is the very first book in the New Testament. Matthew 1:22. It's a good time to check it out together. Matthew 1.22 says, All this took place to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Look, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. Ah, the Bible, especially the New Testament, the Gospel of Matthew, testify that the oracle, the prophecy of the prophet Isaiah about the birth of the Messiah was fulfilled through Jesus Christ. Let the scripture interpret itself. When Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men from the east visited Jesus to pay the homage to the king of Jews. Wise men from the East. Where is the East in this context? Asia. Wise men still come from Asia. Never mind. The birth of Jesus Christ in that particular location was also prophesied by the prophet Micah and was fulfilled according to Bible. Jesus Christ's birth in that place, Bethlehem of Judea, indicate that he is the one that people were talking about, the prophets prophesied. Uh, Micah 5, 2 says, But you, O Bethlehem of Ephrathah, who are one of the little clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to rule in Israel, whose origin is from of old, from ancient days. Hmm. 
The Gospels, again and again, in the New Testament, testify that the prophecies, all the prophets, the Old Testament, are fulfilled through Jesus Christ, indicating that Jesus is the Messiah, the one we anticipated for a long time. Later, when John the Baptist saw Jesus coming toward him, John declared in John 1.29, Here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John the Baptist called Jesus the Lamb of God. What are we talking about here? Later, the Apostle Paul also called Jesus as a Paschal, being passed over the Lamb saying in 1 Corinthians 5, 7, for our Paschal Lamb, Christ, has been sacrificed. Mm. The Bible, biblical figures in the Old, New Testament kept calling Jesus the Lamb of God, Passover Lamb of God. Jesus himself even said this, clarified his central mission as the Messiah, saying in Mark 10, 45, for the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. The introduction of Jesus Christ as the sacrificial Lamb of God in the New Testament wouldn't make much sense without the Old Testament context of the sacrificial ritual system for the forgiveness of sins. Ah, especially Leviticus in the Old Testament provides a great context of, of a sacrificial ritual system. What is surprising to realize that even in the book of Genesis, even in the beginning, in the Garden of Eden, we found a trace which points to Jesus Christ. When Adam and Eve disobeyed God's solemn command and they just ate the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, right? They felt so ashamed of themselves. They noticed they were naked. They tried to hide themselves. And God provided what? The garments of skins to cover them. God's grace was already available for Adam and Eve who were sinful. Ah, uh, in order to provide garments of skins for Adam and Eve, God had to slaughter an animal, right? Which spiritually points to whom? Jesus Christ, as the Lamb of God, who was slaughtered on the cross in our stead for the forgiveness of our, thing, uh, of our sins. The church also has traditionally understood the self-given, self-sacrificial death of Jesus Christ through the oracle about the suffering servant of God in Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53, 4. Shall we check it out? Isaiah 53, 4 through 6. This chapter is, talks of the suffering servant of God. Isaiah 53, 4 says, Surely he has borne our infirmities and carried our diseases. Yet we accounted him stricken, struck down by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole. And by his bruises we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have all turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. According to the oracle of the prophet Isaiah about the suffering servant, God's special servant would go through the suffering hardship on our behalf, in our stead, ah, for the forgiveness of our sins. These biblical references, the Lamb of God, and the suffering servant all are critical interpretative tools and clues for penetrating the meaning of Jesus' death on the cross as the Lamb of God, a suffering servant of God, so that we may be reconciled to God, our Heavenly Father. The Bible tells us what happened to Jesus, and at the same time, it provides what it means to us. Ah. We are exploring how to let the Bible interpret itself by trying to understand what the Bible says and means through the Bible. The last one, the death of the Messiah. D 
deeply puzzling and mysterious. When you think about its meaning, well, how come the Savior of the world, the Son of the living God, even went through that extreme pain and suffering? Ah, it's very deeply mysterious. And we found a great clue for penetrating this conundrum of the cross in Joseph's story in the Old Testament. Mm. Who was Joseph? Joseph was one of the 12 sons of Jacob. Jacob, their father, favored Joseph, and Joseph was spoiled from early on. And their father's favoritism caused a sibling rivalry and envy among the brothers, which eventually caused them to even sell their younger brother Joseph as a slave to a traveling merchant. To keep the long story short, later Joseph became powerful in Egypt thanks to his God-given talent of interpreting the dream. So we call the Joseph the dreamer, right? And during that time, there was a severe drought, famine, starvation all over the world. The Joseph's brother had to uh, travel down to Egypt for their survival, to find food. And Joseph finally encountered his brothers who were looking for food, who even sold him as a slave, mistreated his younger brother. And this is what Joseph said to his brothers in Genesis 50, 20. Shall we check it out? This is a very powerful passage. Genesis 50, 20. Joseph said, Even though you intended to do harm to me, God intended it for good in order to preserve a numerous people as he is doing today. Did you hear that? Joseph forgave his brothers. God even used the evil intentions of Joseph's brothers for the sake of saving God's people in the midst of severe drought and famine. God works in a mysterious way indeed. What's much more, God even made good out of the worst evil at Calvary. Ah, if we apply this interpretative clue found in the Genesis to Jesus' story, this is the message. Even though humans intended to do harm to Jesus, God intended it for good in order to preserve a numerous people. God, our Father, Heavenly Father, God Almighty even used the evil intention of humans. The curious coalition between the religious authority and the Roman Empire against Jesus Christ for the sake of preserving, saving and rescuing God's people. Deeply mysterious. But our God is able, more than able, make good out of our suffering, hardship, even tragedy. Praise the Lord. <laughs> I'm suddenly fired up. <laughs> Powerful message, isn't it? Our God is more than able to bring something good out of the darkest hour, the storm we face, the pain we experience. Hang in there, my brothers and sisters. Everything works for good for you who are called by God, who love God. Ah, God will bring what God has begun in your life to completion in God's time, in God's way. Hold on to the promise. Stand on the promises of God in the name of Jesus Christ. Mm. The Word of God revolves around and points to the Word, living Word, Jesus Christ. So all the scriptures are to be interpreted in the light of Jesus Christ. As we let the Bible interpret itself under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, I believe that Jesus Christ will join in our journey, our walk to Emmaus, and help us to open our spiritual eyes and ears to see God's mysterious plan and purpose and promises for us by opening all the scriptures to us. Ah, oh, God's people said, Amen. Next week, we will explore another critical component of biblical interpretation, the role of the Holy Spirit. Uh, it will be exciting. Coming soon. Don't go anywhere. <laughs> Shall we take a moment to set ourselves on the presence of God? If you don't mind, please close your eyes. I will lead you into prayer time. Lord, 
thank you for allowing us to come back to you and experience your presence in our midst and listen to your voice written in the Bible, spoken through the proclamation and living in our midst as our Lord and Savior. Allow us to fully receive your grace and mercy and experience profound sense of peace and tranquility under your presence and protection. Especially, Lord, thank you for giving us and reminding us of the hope, the message of hope that Jesus Christ, who rose from the dead, broke off the chains of sin and death for us and has conquered the world, is with us, especially as we walk to our Emmaus in this world. Whenever we find ourselves anxious, worried, even depressed and lost and confused and perplexed, the Lord, help us to remember that you are with us. Allow us to experience your powerful presence in our midst. Lean on your everlasting arms. Stand on your promises, Lord, clearly written in the Bible, the word of God for us. Thank you, Lord, for your words, your message for us. Thank you for the gospel for us and for our salvation. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Thank you so much for being with us this morning. I hope that you will stay healthy and safe this week under the protection of the Lord. Hope that you will be back next week as we continue on this journey on Bible Study 101. Go now in peace to love and serve the Lord. Let the Bible interpret itself to you under the guidance of the Holy Spirit so that you may have a deeper understanding of the Word of God and stand on the promises of God. The amazing grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the steadfast love of God the Father, the joyful salvation and fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Change my heart, O oh God. Make it ever true. Change my heart, O oh God. May I be like Change my heart, O oh God Make it ever true Change my heart, O oh God May I be like you You are the potter I am the clay me and make me this is what I say change my heart oh God make it ever true change my heart oh God may I be like you you are the potter, I am the clay. Mold me and make me, this is what I say. Change my heart, oh God, make it ever true. Change my heart, oh God, may I be like